Excellent. How are you guys doing? Oh, my word. Give me a break, people. This is my fourth talk today. So let's try this again. How are you doing? All right. All right. Um, sometimes I teach distance ed courses. Um, in fact, uh, tomorrow morning, I'm teaching one in Nicaragua. But I just checked. This is not a distance ed course. We're in the same room. So we're going to do like interactive stuff. Sound good? And normally, we don't allow beer in my classroom. So I think this might go better. You never know. Maybe we should change that policy. I, I'm not sure. I agree. <laughs> the class would be more popular. <laughs> yeah, I'm in class, Mom. Seriously. Um, so what I want to talk about tonight, uh, what, what Calvin asked me to talk about, um, so if it's a bad idea, it's his fault, um, <laughs> was a little bit about how Python fits in the space for beginners. Now, I know a lot of you are not beginners, especially if you're looking for work. Maybe it's better not to be a beginner at that point. Um, but even if you're not a beginner, is there anybody who is, who's brave enough to say so? You're just learning Python? Yes, you and me. Dude, OK, excellent, great. This is for you. The rest of these people can hang out. Um, but actually, this will be useful for all of us, too, because I don't know about you, but as I've not gotten smarter, but I've gotten grayer. And so people expect me to be able to help them learn how to do things. And as you become a senior dev, you're always ending up having to teach people. Am I right? Most of us are not good at that. I'm just saying. And you know, I love to go on the learning program forums and Reddit and so on. And oh, it's comedy gold. Um, so what are we going to talk about? We'll see how you can think like a programmer, even if you're not sure you can, and how to teach beginners with Python. You like that? Look at that. Woo, that's fun. All right, so you don't need to know much more about me, except here's my favorite thing that Calvin didn't know. I used to be a special ed teacher. Yeah, I know. It was actually Severe Disabilities, North Central High School. That was the best, best preparation for being a computer science teacher I could have ever had. It really was. And I'm not being facetious here. I mean, some of my students are here. They're like, yeah, you're true. Um, yeah, because I learned how to teach. I really learned a lot about teaching, and I'm still learning about teaching 20-some years in. I'm learning a ton about teaching. I actually, I think programming is hard. Do you agree? See, this was the interactive part. Yes, OK, programming is every bit as hard as most people think it is. I think teaching is harder. I honestly do. I think that's the more valuable, more difficult, more rare skill. Um, which is funny, because there's a lot of people with the title who don't have the skill. Um, so uh, yeah, 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 you know all that stuff. Goofy dude, that's the most important one. All right, so how smart are they? Oh, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Nick, can you run outside? I need a rock. Huh? Shoe will work. I'll use my shoe. That's the scary thing. They knew where I was going with this. OK, who's got a good gaming rig? OK, yeah, what you got? Tell us your specs. Well, it's been a couple years, I guess. But it doesn't matter. Uh, 12 gigs of RAM, um, Core i7, um, ETX, NVIDIA's graphics card. Excellent, excellent. Good machine? Good machine, OK. Normally, I have a rock, but I'll just use a shoe. How smart are they? You thought I was talking about the students, didn't you? No, I was talking about how smart are the computers. There's that gaming computer, and there's my shoe. Which one's smarter? It's a tie. It's a tie. And if you don't get that, we're done. That's the most important thing about learning how to be a programmer. Don't you agree? Now I'm going to have to take the other one off, or I'll walk in circles. All right, so how smart are they? Not the people. That's never the problem. The people who I teach usually are super, super. They're really, really clever and bright and wonderful. That's never the problem. I've not encountered anybody yet who couldn't learn to program if they wanted to. I've met several who don't want to. Um, but how smart are they? I'm not talking about the people, I'm talking about the computer. See, the hard part about writing a computer program isn't trying to be as smart as the computer. It's trying to learn how to be as mind-numbingly stupid as a computer. That's the hard part. 
And until you can understand that, you'll never really be able to write programs. Do I get an amen? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So learning to program is hard. If you're just doing it now, do you agree with me? It's hard. And in fact, I'm still learning to program. I've been at this for 30 years. I'm still learning. I'll let you know when I figure it out. I still feel like an idiot all the time. Am I the only one? All the time, I like walk out of my office is like, why do people pay to read my books? Uh, <laughs> people are actually paying to see my class, and I can't even get this stupid thing to work. And my wife is like, get back in there and get it working. She is loving. She is. Awesome. Learning to program, it's hard. Why? Well, program feels different than other skills, doesn't it? Especially to a beginner. Um, yeah, I'm good at cars, but I don't know this stuff. Languages are scary, right? They see codes. Code, that sounds like it's a mystery. You're not supposed to know what it works, how it works. Uh, so the language is scary, there's codes. You know, you think the language is scary, the environments are scary. We have these IDEs, and you know, I look at modern development, and they tell you 25 different steps you have to do before you start opening your first program. That's insane. That is absolutely insane. Well, first you have to develop your environment, especially JavaScript. Don't get me going on that environment right now. Well, the scariest thing? Let's be honest, sometimes it's us, yeah? Because we love to talk in jargon, we love to talk about all these things, and we love all of our really fancy ideas, we love to show off what we've learned, and that might really freak out a beginner, yeah? I'll show you specific examples as we go, don't you worry. Most beginners have failed, a lot, yeah? And a lot of these are people who are pretty smart, they're not used to failing. You know what I'm saying? These are people who did good in school, and they failed, and then they fail again, and maybe they've gotten bad advice. And they follow that advice, and they fail, and they feel stupid. And why would you go back someplace that makes you feel stupid all the time? That's a good, that's a good question. It's super easy to get bad advice, isn't it? We'll do some of that. And, you know, good programmers are often good people, but not always good teachers. Have you found that to be true? I've been one of those. Good programmer, not good teacher. I've been a bad programmer, bad teacher too. Um, so this stuff is hard. I love this. You know, every day I get to find out some bad beginner advice. Here's things that I see on forums and I've actually said probably all of these. Just start with a simple game. You know you want to learn how to program, just start writing a simple, simple game. Like, what kind of game? Oh, something super easy, like Tetris. <laughs> oh, if you've ever tried to write Tetris, it's not simple. Or, you know, just write tic-tac-toe. Oh, dear. Um, or this, start with C++, that's what they use in industry. I especially love that in the gaming community. You know, you really need to learn C++ because that's what they write game engines in. I'm like, you are out of your flipping mind. I love C++, but are you going to begin with that? Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's a super bad idea. Because you know what's going to happen. C++, awesome language. You're going to feel stupid the first 15 seconds, aren't you? If you've, if you've tried to teach a beginner in it, actually C++ starts out OK. C and C out. How hard can this be? Yeah, let's talk about memory allocation, huh? Yikes. If you use Visual Basic, you don't have to code until the very end of the project. That's one of my favorites. You know, my Visual Basic program is all done except for the code. I love that one. Oh, dear. Yeah, I used to teach that. Thank goodness I'm done. Um, the best way to start is to pick a problem you want to solve. I like this one. I like this advice, except it's terrible. Because, see, you know, I'd like to solve world peace. Is that the first problem I should try? <laughs> You know, having goals is good, but if the goals lead to inevitable failure and defeat, maybe we should pick a subset of saving the world first. Um, you'll stay motivated if you work on a real-world problem until you feel like an idiot and leave. Because here's the problem with real world. The real world is messy, isn't it? And so I'm not so sure that we always want to be focusing on real-world problems to start. Here's things I wish I'd been taught when I was a beginner. And I've only learned this after, boy, 20, 30 years of teaching this. And I'm still learning it. 
Programming is not about languages. This is the question I hate the most on these forums, right? Reddit, learn programming. I'm there every day. Two pi, look for me. Um, what language should I start with? And I, like, I have to stop because if I had quadruple size caps lock, I would use it. Wrong question. That's a stupid question. And here's the great thing. You're going to get reams of advice about it. All of it's stupid. Programming isn't about languages. Sure, you're going to pick one. I like Python. But the language ultimately doesn't matter that much. Some will make you feel better earlier. Some will make you feel stupider earlier. Public static void mainstring args. Um, but the language doesn't really matter. Programming was never about languages. You know, here's my guys in the back, right? In the first year of our program, I teach four programming languages. And you know the funny thing? That part's not the hard part. That's what they tell me. Am, am I lying now? No, okay, good. Okay, good. I'll still pay you. Um, yeah, they think that's the hard part. No, the hard part is we keep changing paradigms. The hard part is as soon as we know one language, I start talking about something deeper that we can learn another one. Python's not a good language to teach direct memory management in, for example, because, thank you, it does it for us. But if you're a computer scientist, you better know what direct memory management is. That's when we're going to work in C and C++. Make sense? Yeah. Mem and free? Yeah, you guys don't know that. You're Python people. OK, good. Most people think that programming is about memorizing. I'll never learn all those codes. And I'm like, yeah, neither will I. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't memorize syntax. I couldn't because I use too many languages. You know, on a typical day, I'm helping debug code in six, seven languages. There's no way I could memorize that. OK, this is a good one. Most programming isn't about math. You know, I'll never be a good programmer. I always hated math. First of all, you hated math class. I'm not sure you've met math. <laughs> Secondly, until you get into data science, gaming, and a few other specific areas, you could do fine in programming without using a lot of calculus, right? Who used calculus today? That's what I'm saying. OK, you did. You're very smart. Um, <laughs> and there are places we need it. And certainly, you know, I used linear algebra several times today because I taught a game programming class. But if I wasn't doing that, I might not need it every day. You can get started without math. And here's the fun thing. When you start programming, you're going to realize the kind of thinking you're doing is the kind of thinking that math was trying to teach you in the first place. So there you go. Programming languages, I love this one. Programming languages are simpler than human languages. I know this because 30 years ago, I tried to learn Japanese. And I completely failed. Until very recently, when I tried to learn Spanish. And now all the Japanese is coming out. <laughs> Buenos dias, Tomodachi-san. I'm the only person in the world who's fluent in Japanese. <laughs> Human languages, how much vocabulary do they have? Lots. How many words? Like 100? Thousands. Thousands? OK, how about the syntax rules? How complicated are they? Oh, dear Lord, yeah. Um, you know, my family's all learning Spanish because my daughter's going to school in Nicaragua. And, and, you know, there's tenses I've never even heard of, you know. Past, future, wonderful, undescribed, pred predatory sense. I don't know what it is. But I don't even understand it. How about computer languages? How many words do they typically have in the vocabulary? About 100. How consistent is the syntax? Painfully. <laughs> Programming languages are actually designed to be much more sensible. They're not as flexible. Poetry in programming languages, not quite as successful, except Perl, of course. It has bless, kill, and die. Those are functions in Perl. I can tell you my Perl joke, right? So a thousand monkeys on typewriters, eventually one of them would, would type Shakespeare. The others would all write Perl code. There's not many places you can use Perl jokes. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Programming really isn't about the things most people think it is. Here's another one. Programming, you know, I can't type fast enough to be a programmer. I've heard that one. Uh, actually, probably you should be typing slower. Right? How much of programming is typing? 
close to none of it. Close to none. Is really that the shoe again. It's about explaining things to the idiot computer. That's what programming is. And when we think about it that way, it's actually not quite so frightening. Code isn't about language. Here's what I'm beginning to learn after teaching this for many, many years, because I've taught beginning programming, pick a language. Perl, yes, I taught beginning programming in Perl. And basic and Pascal and Logo, remember Logo? Um, no, some of you don't. Um, and <laughs> Scratch, um, give me a language, C, C++, Java, I've taught them all as beginning languages. And they started to run together. I realized there are some common themes. It turns out when I'm teaching a beginner how to go from not a programmer to a programmer, there's really about seven or eight concepts, depending on how you look at them. You get those and you're done. And those concepts are universal across languages. That's pretty beautiful, isn't it? Nah, true. If you know multiple languages, you know this to be true, right? Your first language is hard. Your second language is harder, isn't it? Because you thought you knew the truth. Your third language, it's like, dude, I'm seeing similarities here. By four or five, you know, you're doing, you're doing, a, a, was, it, was it, oh yeah, you were saying, they asked me to do a project in Pi. I said, give me a weekend. Yeah. It gets that point, doesn't it? Because we see these, these consistencies. Coding is only about eight main concepts. I'll show you my favorite few. How's that? They work in the same way in every language. When we're trying to teach people how to code, don't teach them code. Teach them English. Or teach them in English. The secret isn't code. The secret is algorithms and data. That's really what we're here to teach. And of course, let's pick a language that makes that easy. I nominate Python. If it chooses to run, it's going to win. Um, we write out the concepts first, and then we convert to code later. This is so key. When my students come in to me, and they're like, I'm, I'm so messed up, the first thing they do is sit down, and they open up their computer. And what do I do? I shut it on their fingers. <laughs> Why? If you're lost in coding, it's probably because you shouldn't be coding yet. That's almost always the case. You write out the concepts first and convert to code. In fact, I will grade your paper. If you write a beautiful algorithm and not a line of code, you'll still probably pass. Doesn't happen often because if they write the algorithm well, the code comes. If you turn in beautiful code that runs great without any comments in it, I give it back. That's how important this is, after midterm anyway. So most beginners, this is so amazing. When you, when you, if you are a beginner, and I still am, you get to this point where you think you don't understand how to write the code. I can't tell you how many times people say, I know what I'm doing. I just don't know which code to write. Uh, no, no. Almost every time somebody says, I just don't know how to write it. No, that's not the problem. The real problem is they don't understand the problem they're trying to solve. They're jumping straight to coding without understanding algorithms. And I get that. Because coding's cool, right? You look like a hacker. I showed my son Hacker Typer. You know that site, hackertyper.com? Oh, you need this. <laughs> Hackertyper.com, all you have to do is bang on the keyboard furiously, and it looks like you're writing C code. And if you hit the right control sequence, it says, like, you're in, NATO or whatever. Yeah, it's awesome. Because that's what all, all of the students think they're going to learn how to do anyway. Yeah, and now you're all going there. I love it. The real problem is that beginners don't always understand the problem they're trying to solve. They try to figure out how to do it before they try to figure out what to do. And really experienced people like us, we do that too, don't we? Every day. Every day. All right, here's one of my favorite ideas. And then we'll actually dig in and do some. Sound good? Comments are code. Lit. All right, so we all know what comments are for. Comments are there to explain code to other programmers. You agree? Sure, sure. Which explains why we never write them, doesn't it? Because um, if the comments are there, first of all, it's their own dang fault if they can't understand my code. 
Secondly, I don't want to explain what it does until I'm sure I know, and that may never happen. <laughs> little painful, painful little giggles there. Yeah, because this is true, right? We're all here. Um, and you know, I gotta get this thing delivered, man. It's deadline. I'll do my best to get the comments in at the last step, but I gotta get it working before I can worry about that. Yeah? So comments are there to explain the code to other programmers, or better yet, yourself, because a week later you're like, crud, what did this do? No. No, no, I finally learned the truth. Comments are not there to explain the code to programmers. Code is there to explain the comments to the computer. That's profound. That is, that's all I got, good night, I'll see ya. Um, <laughs> code is there to explain comments to the computer, at least for beginners. But again, I still consider myself a beginner. You write your algorithm first. You got that algorithm first working, it's beautiful. And then, how do you know it's done? It's like a turkey, right? The little thing pops out. No. How do you know that an algorithm is done? You look at every line, and at this point, maybe you've even decided what language you're going to use. And you say, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. Oh, better look that one up. Break it up into smaller things. I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. At that point, now we can start thinking about code. That sounds really mean, doesn't it? My students think so too, until they do well, and they all earn more than me, so now they don't think it's so bad. So <laughs> this is an important idea. All right, so let's go into, I said there were only seven or eight main concepts. Let's do our favorite first four. How's that? No? Okay, it's been nice seeing you again. Um, here's the way I like to think about it, because really, algorithms, you can say that, and people are like, nah, I don't know, I don't know. But let me show you exactly how we like to think about these. I actually have one chart that I'll make, and uh, it was uglier than the slideshow, so you know, if you want it, I'll give it to you. But I have one chart, and I say, you understand this? It's an HTML table, it's that ugly. You understand this? You've got programming. Oh, you want to do it in Java? One second, change it all. Okay, great. I change one column. So I just rebuild that table for every language we teach in. But here's the ideas. Now, the first idea is about variables, right? Variables are about data. So those of you who are really beginners, today's our moment. If you're not a beginner, you're like, oh, I know this. Right, but someday you're going to teach it to someone, okay? And, and the real issue isn't just a variable. Okay, it's a place of memory to hold data. Great, we know that. Um, but here's the interesting thing about this approach to learning, is that I say, first thing you need to know is there is such a concept as make a new variable. And when I'm writing an algorithm, this is one of the things I can pick. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna make a variable. So that's on your drop-down list of things you can do. Make sense? There's only about eight or nine of these, really. But when you say that, as soon as you say, I'm gonna make a new variable, some questions should pop in your mind. Oh dear. Hey, there's some HTML code. Why did that just die? All right. Um, so some questions should pop in your mind, right? Doesn't matter what language you're in. No, same questions. Anytime we make a variable, I guarantee you're going to need to know what's its name. What's its type? What sort of data does it hold? Those of us who've been programming for a while know that computers are a little fussy about that. You know, we have integers that don't have decimal point stuff, and we have floating point numbers that have that, and then we have strings, which is the much cooler way to say text. And then we got other stuff too, and it depends on which language, how fussy you are about that sort of thing, right? If this was a Java group, they'd be like, yeah, strict data types, baby. We're Python, we're like, meh, it's all the same. <laughs> we'll decide later. But does it still matter what type something is? Even if maybe our language isn't too fussy about it? We shall see. Um, initial value, what's its starting value? So would you agree whenever you make a variable in any language you think of these things? There might be some others like scope, but I'm gonna save that for functions. Scope doesn't mean much if you don't have functions yet. So whenever I make a variable, that's what I think. Do you agree? Okay, here's where you say yes, no, yes, please go home. Okay, good, good, thank you. So how do you write an, al an algorithm? This is the part I'm proud of. Okay, that's not the part I'm proud of. When it works, it's the part. See, it scrolls. 
How do you write an algorithm? Here's the beautiful thing. You must write in English. No coding allowed. Unless, of course, English isn't your favorite language, and Swahili, whatever, cool, awesome. Create all, whatever it is. I don't care. But your sentence has to answer those questions. It has to answer the question, what's its name, what's its starting value, and what's its type? That's your algorithm. Does that make sense? So when we're teaching a beginner to make a variable, the first thing they need to know is, I need to make a variable. And then the second thing they need to know is, what questions should I always answer when I make a variable? Does that make sense? And then when we do that, honestly, that's all they need. But see, if I could get away with it, I wouldn't even teach a language yet. But they don't believe it's real coding unless they're typing somewhere. So fine, we'll do it. That's how we write this in Python. Name gets an it val type, ha, huh, you're on your own. But that's how we do it in Python, so I can live with that. Can you live with that? Yeah, yeah sure, because we're Python programmers. So that's good. So that's one of our concepts. Here's another concept. I mean, it seems trivial, doesn't it? But it isn't. It isn't. Output, right? What's another thing I can do? Well, I can tell the user stuff. I'm going to start here with the command line console, because life is easier there, isn't it? We're in charge. I mean, in the GUI, the user's in charge. And who put them in charge? Not me. Um, but output is pretty easy. There's only one thing to worry about. What message do I want to send the user? And of course, output's usually text, isn't it? Yes, it's text. Okay. Yeah, output's text. Um, so that's pretty easy. And we could write an algorithm for an output line, too, couldn't we? Don't worry, there's a quiz coming. Output the text message. OK, that is really easy. Yeah, you code? Yay for Python 3. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> System.out.println. No, no, no. Console.outWriteLine. No, it's easy. It's print. Except I always, yeah, C out. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> printf. What's a printf? I don't know. You know, I still mess up the parentheses for sometimes because I did 2.7 for a long time. Wrote a whole book in two, so the parentheses sometimes throw me, but I can do this. Now, how much are we worried about the Python syntax? Have you seen how much we've stressed about that? Why not? Because you all know it. But why? Because that's the part we can look up. How do I do it in this language? That part Google will help us with, won't it? If you try to Google how, what problem am I trying to solve, you're going to get some very scary results. But if you know what you're trying to do, you know I'm trying to output text, you can say, how do I output text in Python 3? And the chances are you'll get something pretty close to this, yes? So the coding part is the easy part. The algorithm part is the hard part. All right. So we're getting to the point where we have enough of these tools we can start to put together a real program. There's you know, input. Now, input, I like talking about input because this is the first one that really starts to talk about the real complexity of coding, isn't it? Because, see, all of the other things were atomic. They could kind of stand on their own. But input is really mean. Input has, like, dependencies, doesn't it? I mean, think about it. When I, when I input something, here, um, tell me the answer. Tell me the answer. Come on. 42. 42, that's a good one. I like that. Um, yeah, I'm coveting that t-shirt. Um, it's not fair for me to ask you the answer if I didn't ask a question, is it? It's never stopped me as a teacher, but if I am asking for an answer, I should really give you a question. So an input applies that there was some question asked of the user. It may be in that statement as it is in Python. It may be another line. It doesn't matter much. But somehow we're going to ask the user a question. Well, OK, now um, throw me the ball. Throw me the ball. Come on, you guys can help. Throw me the ball, please. Yeah, you have a ball. Throw it. <clears throat> you know what I should have done? I should have put up my mitt. I shouldn't ask for somebody to throw something if I'm not ready to catch it. Yeah? Input. You have to have a variable to answer, to hold the answer. You have to have a question that you ask them. So the crazy thing about input is it should never be the first line of your algorithm. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense because there's, there's like prerequisites. 
And so you need to, either in the input statement itself or in another statement, you need to ask a question and you already need to have a variable in place that can catch the answer. Well, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? And what does that have to do with Python syntax? Nothing. That's a different problem and an easier one, isn't it? That's an easier problem. Okay, so how would we do an algorithm? Again, any one you want. Any line of algorithm, as long as it answers those questions, makes me happy. Ask the user a message and store the answer in variable. Beautiful. We good with that? You want to see code? You've seen the code, but it's easy. Variable gets input message. But you see the point I'm trying to make? When we understand the concepts, the code itself becomes actually, at some point, and this is why we don't always write comments, right? At some point, this is more clear than that. But not for a beginner. Not for a beginner. So a beginner has to do this part for a while before they can jump straight to the code. Does that make sense? Because we've forgotten that sometimes. And to the beginners that we're trying to help, this looks like arrogance. It's not. It's forgetfulness. But we can see there's not a cleaner way to say that. I really can't think of an easier way to say that in any of the languages I use. Thank you, Guido. Um, but we forget that it's not obvious to beginners. OK, that's enough. We can write a program, can't we? Sure, we could. With just that. All right, I'm not going to actually make you write it because I want to get to some other stuff. But here's the program we would write. Now, for real life, I would stop right here. No more. We've learned plenty. You can't make me teach you another line of code. <laughs> because we would stop, we'd get out paper and pencil, and we would write some algorithms together in groups, not by yourself. If you're really confused, find somebody who's feeling very comfortable and make them uncomfortable. And we write this out. And if you turn on a computer, I will slap, the, I will slap it shut on your fingers. Because I don't want computers right now. I want brains. Those are much better computers anyway, right? And so we write this. No code. That's really hard for those of us who think in code, isn't it? Yes, I sometimes do dream in code. It's terrifying. Especially when my dreams involve memory leaks. It's a bad, bad thing. <laughs> Honey, just turn on the Valgrind. She's like, what's a Valgrind? Never mind, never mind. <laughs> Algorithm only. I'll go ahead and do it for us. There's my first try. You see what I did here? No code. Create an integer variable for x. Create an integer variable for y. Create an integer variable for sum. Did I answer those questions? Yeah, OK. Ask the user x and put the answer in x. Ask the user y and put the answer in y. Put x plus y in sum. Tell the user the answer is sum. This is awesome. OK. Some of you know there's a problem. And some of you are like, seriously, I could have just written this. Right, but you're not a beginner anymore. If you're a beginner, you need to write it this way first. Now, here's the beautiful thing about Py Python, right? We're a half a step away from Python because Python is beautiful, except for a few warts. Come on. Name equals main. Yeah. That's pretty stupid. Um, I love Python, but that's its wart. Come on. It's still there. It's still there. And the whole self thing. Oh, please. <sighs> if you're going to require self as a parameter, then tell me the right number of parameters when there's an error in the function, because my beginners are freaking the heck out. It says it only has two parameters when there's three missing, but there's four. I'm like, no. <laughs> OK. So first, we just write this as plain text. Paper and pencil is better than on code. Whiteboard is my favorite. Lipstick on a mirror, cool. Blood on the wall, don't do that. Um, but, but we come up with a plan. Then we take the plan, and now we convert it to comments. Now you can put it in your text editor. Which one? I do not care. If you're spending a lot of time stressing about it, wrong one. I'm actually still a Vim guy. I'm that nerdy. I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, I'm there, man. Oh, I love me some Vim. But I'm not going to impose that on, OK, second class I do. But, um, but in the first class, no, 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 I'm not going to make you do that. But I want your editor out of the way. 
I'm not a huge fan of syntax highlighting. That doesn't solve the real problems, does it? Or code completion and all that stuff. That doesn't solve the real problems. That solves the easy ones. The real problem is how do you think well? And the cleaner your editor is, the easier we get there. This is a pretty good answer, isn't it? Is it code? Well, technically, we could put it in an editor and it wouldn't crash. Um, it's a great algorithm. OK, at least it's a good algorithm. Would you agree? No? Yes. No, I'm sad. OK. I like it. Now the next step. OK, now we can put in code. And so every line, and this again is something that we love to teach our beginners, or I do, everybody else hates it. Um, and, and that is, okay, now that you've got those comments, one line at a time, you look for that comment and you tell me how to write it in code. Go crazy with Google if you want, do it. Of course, I taught this in China and they said, what's Google? Okay, Baidu, good luck. Um, <laughs> got stories about that, man. <laughs> Teaching Java in China. Please teach advanced Java in English. You've got one month. I got there and realized they didn't know basic Java or English. <laughs> and that was the translator. Um, yeah, it was crazy. Um, so now each of these things I can say, dude, I can write that. I can make that. And in fact, this is the first time that it even matters what language we're in. You know, maybe I'll go to the Java users group. I'll just change this slide. <laughs> the others are fine. Um, except, you know, I can't make the comment about public static void mainstream args, which is, huh? Oh, yeah, it's, it's coming. Yeah, I'll show it to you. Yeah, I've got, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, don't you worry. Anyway, so we can take each one of these things and we can convert it to code. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Yes, that's beautiful. Well, yeah. And then, of course, we could test it. And again, I'm not too fussy. If you don't have a copy of Python on your own machine right now, um, that's not a big barrier. Um, I love some of the online environments. Python Anywhere, um, love that one. In fact, I've got it running on there, so you don't have to install it on your own machine if you don't want to. No good reason not to. Come on, you're using Ubuntu, right? You've already got it. Um, here, I happen to have it running, I think. Adderworm.py. Okay. So there's that same thing I just copied and pasted. Should we run it? Oh, I am all a Twitter. Here we go. Okay. Come on, give me some code. Yes. I don't know what that is, but I think it's funny. Okay. X, three, Y, five. This is going swimmingly. 35. Oh dear. <laughs> really should have tested this, shouldn't I? No, I knew what was gonna happen. See, look at my next slide. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Okay, this is where we all go wrong. This is where we all go wrong. First of all, the first thing we do, failure is a wonderful thing. If you don't like failure, you're in the wrong business. Because how often do we have miserable crashes? a day, a minute. I mean, it happens all the time, right? If you can't be big about that, then you're in the wrong job. I don't know what job is good for you, but this one isn't. Because it's gonna crash a lot. But our failures are opportunities for us to grow. And we have to have a good attitude about that. And you know what? We should teach debugging the very first moment. Because there is no programming that isn't debugging, isn't it? I mean, how much of programming is debugging and how much of it is actual programming? It's pretty much all debugging, isn't it? Begin debugging now. Now here's where everybody gets in trouble. One thing we all like to do, especially those experienced people, is we jump right at what the answer is, right? We start solving this sucker. And often, because we have a lot of experience, we do it very well. It really pisses the students off when I do that. I don't even see it. We're walking in the hallway, and I can tell them what line's wrong, and I'm usually right. That really pisses them off, except at least their code's working. Because I've given this assignment for a few times and I know exactly why it's acting stupid. Um, but did you tell it what to do incorrectly? That's what most beginners think. I must have typed the wrong code because they still think that programming is about writing codes. That's what they always assume. Or did you tell it to do the wrong thing? 
okay, we can think about this example. Did we tell it how to do it wrong? Or did we tell it to do the wrong thing? Yeah, one of those. We don't know. That's a beautiful answer. We don't know. I don't know is the best answer any programmer could give me. Because if you do know and it's not right, you don't know. This is one I hate. I just have one simple problem, professor. Then why are you in my office? If it was simple, you would have solved it. You've done something boneheaded, I know, and I'll help you, but don't pretend it's simple. <laughs> so often, we think that we just did it wrong, but what happened is we did the wrong thing. Maybe with a good conscience, but beginners almost always assume it's an implementation problem when it's almost always an algorithm problem. Is that the case here? Almost. It's an understanding problem. And that's okay. That's okay. That's wonderful. That's going to happen every day. And you know what? I could have prevented that. I could have taught you how to convert to an int first, right? But I don't want to. Because the beautiful thing is embracing those, isn't it? Embracing the fact that when we learn how to code, we fail all the time. And boy, do you wish you'd learned this slide 100 years ago? I still don't know how, but I've been, yeah, I, debuggers are good. I like debuggers, although you can depend on them. Okay, this is my Mr. Miyagi-ism of the day. <laughs> Best way to debug code, not have bugs. Um, and uh, as, although it's facetious, is it true? Yeah, the best way to debug your code is to write code defensively so bugs don't creep in. That's very hard to do. It takes a lot of experience. There's other things you can do, though. Bad implementation. If I just did it wrong, I could Google that. If Google's not getting you the right answer, you probably don't have bad implementation. You probably have bad algorithms or a bad understanding of the problem space. Those are much harder to find in Google, aren't they? Bad algorithms, you can't look those up. There's probably something you're not understanding. Does that make sense? Something's not acting like, it, like it's supposed to. And that's when a debugger, the idle debugger is good. Again, I'm still a PDB kind of guy. I'm just that old school. Because man, a command line, dude, I can do a lot. Um, but there's something I'm not understanding. Go in super slow-mo, look at that thing, print stuff out. See if you can find out something that you're trying to do is not doing what you think it is. You know, are there some tools that I can look at to help me? Of course, a debugger's good. In this case, you know, we could, we could start looking at, hey, isn't there a command to find out what type something is in, in Python? Yes, it's called type. Um, but here's the thing, I, I, it makes me crazy, because I do it every time. Well, you know, here's what you, here's what you need to do. Right? We start solving problems we don't understand. How often have you done that? Today. <laughs> we are constantly solving problems we don't understand, and how often do we make them better? How often do we make them worse? Um, so don't <laughs> start with a solution. Unless you're using Git, then just, okay, make it a new branch and then go ahead. Um, but don't start with a solution because you're going to mess yourself up, aren't you? And I have people come to me all the time. They just swear, swear, Python is broken because it's not working and it should. Okay, there's something you're not understanding and there's nothing wrong with that but there's something you're not understanding, and your assumptions are probably a big part of the reason you're not understanding things. You're assuming things that aren't true. Do some detective work, Sherlock. Let's figure out what's going on. Let's get in there and find out what's happening. There's lots of tools for that. You gotta start by understanding the problem. A lot of times, I'll turn off the computer. I'll be like, eh. turn off that computer. Here's a whiteboard marker. When they moved my office, um, they were going to take away my whiteboard and my bookshelves. And I said, you can have my computer. <laughs> uh, true, <laughs> true story. And they were like, you're nuts. OK, we'll give you the whiteboard because you, you scare us a little. Um, so what did happen here? OK, now you can say, it's easy to assume the plus sign is broken. Dang it, this thing doesn't even know how to add. That's a normal assumption, though, isn't it? How stupid is this? Now, that's not really the problem. Those of us who are experienced, see, we're feeling superior. 
because we already know how, because we've already felt like idiots long ago when we forgot it. Or we're just kind of a little, you know, yeah. Because we've all made this one, haven't we? The plus sign is not really the problem. What's really the problem? Ew, try this. You know, Python has that interactive mode. I love that, right? If I try to do Python plus meetup, what's it going to say? Python meetup. There we go. Wait a minute. Wait a cotton picking minute. You can't add Python and meetup, can you? Okay, be careful here, because you know I'm about to slap you. Because somebody wants to say, well, operator overloading is a form of polymorphism, and it's actually concatenating rather than adding because it's automatically detecting that these are strings and not integers. Yeah, slap you with a wet fish for that. When you're around beginners. Right? When you're around beginners, this is the worst thing we can say because they're like, yeah, you just switched into serbo Croatian or something. <laughs> they felt stupid before, now they feel worse. Um, so, yes, is, it, is all that stuff true? Yes, and is it wonderful when you understand it? Yup. But do you have to understand that the first day? No. No. No, I think it's enough to say, hey, it's the plus sign is so smart that it does different things when it sees text and when it sees numbers. And apparently, it thinks that five and three is text. I wonder if that's the problem. Can I test that? Right, and then we Google again. Is there a way to find out what type of data something is? Is there? Yeah, is it type or type of? I get JavaScript and Python confused every time. I always guess wrong the first one. It's type, okay. So we can apparently add text. Yes, concatenation. I wonder if it thinks two and three are text. We look up a tool, the type function tells us what we want to know. Okay, now we add a new tool to our toolbox. You see what I'm saying? Now we add a new tool to our toolbox and we say, all right, all right, cool. Um, I need a new algorithm piece, convert to integer. Go look it up, figure out what you have to do. Looks like we have an old int variable, an int variable, and convert old variable to integer, store an int variable. Oh, look, there's code for it. That's all fun, isn't it? Now we have a new tool, and that's how we continue growing, is as we encounter a problem, we develop a new algorithmic tool to get there. Does that make sense? Um, so this is, this is pretty kind of fun, isn't it? It is, really, in a geeky way. All right, I know. Um, now we can try again with a new tool. Notice what I did. I killed my code. I can't believe it. it took me hours to write that. No, it didn't. It took you about... 30 seconds to write it. It took you hours to understand it, and you understood it wrong. Really hard to get people to throw away code, isn't it? Like us? All right, okay, fine. Put it in a subdirectory, but start fresh. Git, again, man, I love Git. Um, but start fresh, because if it was worth keeping, it would have worked. And you didn't lose the thought process, you just got yourself in a bad place. So I'm gonna rewrite my algorithm now, and I'll tell you the truth. I wrote this wrong the first time. I put it in the wrong order. But before I wrote any code, I was like, dude, that's in the wrong order. That's not gonna work. You see this? I'm thinking about programming before I write code. Because it's often easier to see the order of things. See, I converted too early. But now that I look at that, I'm like, that makes sense. I could do that on a whiteboard. I can be the computer. And now we'll put some code in. Will this work? Yeah, we can prove it. I can run it, but it, it works. Um, there's branching. There's for loops. I want to talk a little bit about while loops, though, and then we'll be done. You good with that? Because I don't know how long we're supposed to go, but you know, it could be the next election cycle before I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> it's an endless loop. That's the problem. Yeah. I, uh, let's just skip this one. Okay. So, um, you know, for loops, people sometimes get mad, Python people, when they see the way that I teach for loops, because I say that a for loop has lots of parts. It has a century. It has a start. It has a finish. It has a change. And you're like, that is such a C++ for loop. What is the matter with you? And yeah, and I teach for loops in Python. 
You can see my code. For I in range start finish change. Oh, that is so unpythonic. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because sometimes I want to teach Python and sometimes I want to teach programming. Um, and when I'm teaching beginners, I'll do this. If Python is your second or third language, we'll do it with iterators. Um, but this traditional structure lines up better with other languages, but much more important, it's much better for learning to debug properly. Because when you have a loop, what are the three things you always think about in a loop? Well, four things, really. First is the sentry. What is this variable that controls the whole thing, right? And then what are three things about the sentry you need to know? Sing along, people, you know this. How's it start? How's it finish? How's it change? Which seems so simple, right? But how many loops have you had that have gone terribly wrong? <laughs> uh, what's the most likely basic code structure to go wrong? A loop. Especially if you see a Boolean operator in that son of a gun. Death to Boolean operators. Yes. Yep. Or the falseness. <laughs> you gave me that one. That was too easy. We're going to come back to that thought real quick. Anyway, a while loop. So what are the four things you need to know about a while loop? What's the century? How's it start? How's it end? How's it change? But no, that's not true, Andy. The while loop has only one parameter. That's the problem with while loops. The while loop implies a lot that it doesn't require. And that's why while loops go wrong so often, don't they? Because if you're going to make a while loop, you will also have a holy obligation to, to think about what the sentry is, even though the while loop doesn't require you to. You have to initialize the sentry before you got there, which means you have to plan ahead, which means why are you writing code? You should be doing algorithms. And then somewhere inside the loop, we don't know where, you have to change the sentry, and you have to change it in a way that guarantees that at one point you'll trigger the condition. Oh yeah, we need a condition. But you never forget that one. You will sometimes make a condition that's impossible to, to satisfy, though, won't you? Not a marriage seminar or something, but no. Um, <laughs> so these are the same things that are required in a while loop, and that's why I teach them first in a for loop. Because how easy is it to mess that up? No, you don't do it. All right, here we go. Here's the example. Basic password loop. We've all done this one, right? It exits with a positive result if the user chooses the right password. But if they get it wrong, it launches missiles. So if you get it wrong three times, sorry about your luck sending the missiles. All right, we could all do this. How are you going to code it? Okay, really, how are you going to code it? All right, we'll use a compound condition, right? With a Boolean. Now, I love Boolean variables, don't get me wrong. It's Boolean operators that bug me. Um, because here's why. Because what condition do we need on this thing? Let's see, tries is greater than or equal to three, and guess is not equal to correct? Yeah, that's it. Or is it because now guess is a negative, and De Morgan's law, if it's, it's a Boolean variable, okay, Take a picture, because it could go away. Um, so correct is indie pi, tries is zero, keep going is true, well, keep going. You know what I love about Boolean variables? There's just a not, not a lot that can go wrong. It's about the cleanest variable type you got, right? I love Boolean variables. I don't love Boolean operators as much, unless I'm working on just Boolean variables with them. But well, keep going. If this thing is true, and is it? It better be. Well, I'll keep going, it's true, do whatever code I want. Yes, I deliberately did not do the format thing because I don't want to freak out beginners. It's really cool, but not today. Um, now take a look. If guess is equal to correct, then we'll say, that's great, here's the treasure. And then look at this beautiful thing. That's where, that's where the break statement goes, doesn't it? Now, we should never write break, should we? I know, switch statements. Thank you for not including those, Guido. Yeah. Um, keep going, it's false. That means the next time I evaluate this loop, we're out. How clean is that? 
And what do I really mean by this line? I don't want to keep going. I like that. Do you like that? It's going to be much easier to follow. Else, if the tries is, I didn't really do Elif. Elif is like a dwarf, but it's taller and in the ears. Um, if tries is greater than or equal to three, then we're going to print, hey, too many wrong tries launching the missiles. Once again, we're not directly exiting the loop, but we're telling it the next time you evaluate, I don't want to keep going anymore. You know what's funny is I don't know the last time I wrote a while loop that didn't just say, while well, keep going. <laughs> because once you get used to this, man, it's beautiful. It is just beautiful. Um, and I write a lot of games. You know, game code gets messy, doesn't it? <laughs> Let me tell you, no code gets messier than game code. Uh, partially because we don't design for maintenance in gaming. You know it's going to be out of date in a, in, in a year. So in gaming, you don't design it to be maintained. You design it to be fast. And so you write some junk. Um, OK, eventually we'll teach all these things at their time, but not today. You good with that? Um, yeah, no. Let's just stop with this. So why Python, right? I mean, I've taken a lot of time to tell you tonight that the language doesn't matter, yet it's a Python group. And I, I do love Python. Um, so if the language doesn't matter, why did we choose Python? Well, I'll show you. Okay, you recognize this, right? What language are we in? Old school C, man, this is the way God intended. <laughs> Pointers everywhere, no strings. Those strings are for wusses. All right, there's some C. And there's kind of, you know, hello world is too simple to really get the feel of a language, isn't it? So I say, really, we need to do hello user. That is, it asks the user's name, and then it does something with it. That's the smallest program I think we can really get the sense of a flavor of a language. Would you agree? And would it be possible for me to take that little chart we just did and show you how to do all those things in C? Absolutely. Absolutely, there's C. But don't worry. Hey, Bjorn, how you doing, buddy? See, all these people in the open source world, they have the best names, don't they? You know, Guido and Bjorn and stuff like that. Yeah. I figure that's the only reason I'm not at the top of the open source world, is my name is too obvious. I was going to go with one of those sub-Saharan languages with clicking and stuff. My name is Eric Harris. Either that or just switch the, skip the human languages altogether, go to Dolphin. I'm sorry. All right, so C++. Wow, at this level, C++ looks like a dream, doesn't it? No more printf. C++ must be easy. Yeah, if you've done some. Yeah. <laughs> if in deaf, anyone? Yep. Yep, OK, C++ is pretty nice at this level, but it gets hard fast. All right, here's my favorite, right? Public static void mainstream args. Have you ever tried to teach Java to a beginner? Have you ever been to a beginner Java class? I mean, every Java teacher in the world who has to teach beginners. And this was me. That's what they wanted in Nicaragua. Please teach this in Java. I'm like, oh, OK, great. Please wave a dead chicken over your shoulder. Turn around three times. It's a ritual. Throw salt. Type this line. And they're like, we do not have a chicken. Never mind. I don't really mean that. It's just a ritual because I don't want to teach you what a static method is yet. That doesn't make sense if we haven't done objects and we shouldn't be doing objects yet. You're just trying to make a variable. Um, so this makes me crazy. Now, I love me some Java. I do love Java. Um, and I love Java for more advanced programmers because it doesn't let you do some stupid things that we like to do anyway, right? Dual inheritance. Um, now, I look at my kids. I think multiple inheritance is a good idea there. Um, so there's Java. Yeah. It makes sense, doesn't it? Could we again, like all these languages, could I take that chart and make it work for Java? Sure, I've done it. So why Python? That's why. If you want to teach a beginner to program, which of these languages is easiest to translate from the algorithm to code that actually works? That's what I love about Python. Because since I don't care about the language, how about we pick one that gets out of the way and gives them success? 
I want them to succeed. I want them to feel proud. I, I want them to fail because that's going to happen, but I want them to overcome that failure. And so a language that helps us do that, that makes me happy. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? That makes me happy. And I like successful students. And here's the other thing. They are going to want to make games. Fine, we can do that. Somebody's going to want to write a database. Yeah, SQLite's built in. Good enough. They all want to do GUIs. Okay, fine, TK. Yeah, TK. But, hey, it's built in. Um, what do you want to do? Sure, we can do it. Get it out of your system. You want to do web apps? I taught that tonight. I showed them, they were still, this is their first Python class, I showed them Bottle because there's no installation. Because <laughs> I don't want to deal with installing Flask on the you know, computers. Um, how cool is this? Isn't this fun? So um, that's really where I am. Um, I love to teach beginners because I love the process of learning. And I always learn far more than them. So thank you for your time. I'll be around to answer any questions. Um, you guys have been awesome. It's a lot of fun. <laughs>